Hello everybody and welcome to Fly High. Somebody wants to find the helicopter as thousands of parts flying in close formation around an oil leak waiting for metal fatigue to set in. And it's true, when you actually look at the thing, it's amazing that it does fly. Today we're going to look at how it all works. A helicopter has rotor blades just as an airplane has wings. An airplane speeds down a runway to get into the air and a helicopter turns its rotor blades at high speed. The wings or the blades, known as airfoils moving through the air, creates lift and the aircraft takes off. That's a fact, but as to why and how it works, there are several different theories and not everybody agrees. I'll tell you about them and let you make up your own mind. According to Bernoulli's principle, when airflow is forced through a narrowing path, it speeds up. When the speed increases, the pressure decreases. Bernoulli's principle is demonstrated in an enclosed tube with a restricted area in the middle. The shape of an airfoil is compared to the bottom part of the tube. The theory is that as the airfoil is thrust through the air, the air molecules are separated here and joined up again over here. Because the air sliding over the top has more distance to cover, it moves faster than the air on the bottom, so the pressure is lower on top and the higher pressure underneath pushes it up. Next, we look at the Kuwanda effect, which shows that air blown over a curved surface tends to stick to it. If I blow on this bottle, you would think that it's an obstacle protecting the flame of the candle behind it and that the air is just going to bounce off the bottle. Because the bottle has a cylindrical shape, the air flow sticks to the surface and blows out the candle on the other side. The theory is that the airflow entrains the static air surrounding the bottle, creating a low pressure area over here, and so the higher pressure close by pushes it back against the surface. Apply this to the stream of air over the top of an airfoil, creating a low pressure zone here. The higher pressure above deflects the stream of air downwards and it pulls the airfoil towards it. This is Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Lastly, still looking at Newton's third law, when the moving airfoil is positioned at an angle, the air underneath it is deflected downwards. The equal and opposite reaction would be the airfoil being pushed or pulled upwards. We can demonstrate these theories with a piece of paper. If you hold it like this, it has a curved shape of an airfoil. Blow air over the top and it rises. Blow air underneath and it rises too. You can also try this with a spoon and running water. Hold the back of the spoon close to the running water and instead of the water pushing the spoon away as you'd expect, you'll feel it get sucked into the flow. So there you have three different theories. Is it Bernoulli, Kawanda or Newton? Could it be a combination of two of the theories? Or is it all three? Let us know what you think in the comments below. We'd love to hear your opinion. Regardless of the theory, they all prove that the secret of a flying airfoil is in its shape and the angle between the airfoil and its horizontal plane, otherwise known as the pitch angle. During the startup procedure of a helicopter, the pilot will roll the throttle onto 100% RPM. In an R22 engine, that's about 2,600 rotations per minute. The main gearbox transfers the power from the engine to the rotor assembly, turning the blades at about 530 rotations per minute. It will stay at 100% for the duration of the entire flight, even when the helicopter's on the ground. It's not as one may think that by turning the blades faster, the helicopter takes off. When on the ground, the rotor blades are in a horizontal position. The shape of the blade is symmetrical, so the air has the same distance to travel, whether over the top or the bottom. The blades slide through the air without much disturbance, nor resistance or drag. To lift off into a hover, the pilot pulls up on the collective control to adjust the pitch angle of each rotor blade equally and according to Bernoulli, Kuanda and or Newton, creates lift. If you put your hand out of a moving car and hold it horizontally, there is very little or no lift. You just have to tilt your hand slightly for it to be pushed upwards. 
Same thing with the rotor blades of a helicopter. If you increase the pitch angle of the blades until the lift force is greater than the weight of the helicopter, it goes up. And if you decrease the pitch angle of the blades until the lift force is less than the weight of the helicopter, it will go down. Okay, so now we know how to get the helicopter into the air. But if we go back to Newton's action-reaction law, if you have the engine turning the rotor blades in one direction, the body or the fuselage to which the engine is attached is going to spin around in the opposite direction. You might experience the same phenomenon, for example, when you don't hold a drill correctly, it will turn in the opposite direction of the drill bit. Or if you load a mixer too heavily, well, it does this. For a helicopter, this is obviously a problem, but there are different solutions. Some helicopters have a second rotor that turns in the opposite direction. Two opposing rotors with the same force counteract each other's torque. The tandem rotor system has two rotors mounted one behind the other, as on this Boeing CH-47 Chinook. The coaxial system has one rotor on top of the other, like on this CAMOV KA-32. And the intermeshing rotor system has two rotors that cross over each other, like on the K-MAX. Helicopters that have only one main rotor need a separate anti-torque system. The most common system is a tail rotor that is vertical and smaller. Tail rotors are also driven by the main rotor gearbox, which transfers part of the engine power to the tail rotor gearbox, which makes it turn at a constant speed and at a higher RPM than the main rotor. The R22 tail rotor has a 3,396 RPM. It works very much in the same way as the main rotor and creates lift or rather thrust in the opposite direction to that in which the fuselage rotates. The conventional tail rotor can be two-bladed as with the Robinson helicopters or multi-bladed on bigger helicopters like the Sikorsky S61. The ducted fan or fantail system, also known by the trade name of Fenestron, has from 7 to up to 18 smaller blades enclosed within the tail boom. This has a safety advantage. By shielding the tail rotor itself from collision, as well as protecting ground personnel from the hazard of a conventional spinning tail rotor. Another advantage is a noise reduction possibility. The blades may have variable angular spacing so that the sound they make is distributed over different frequencies. Another less common but also ingenious anti-torque system is the NOTAR, like this MD Explorer has. The tail rotor is inside the top end of the tail boom and acts like a fan pumping air down towards the end. Air is vented out through two slots on the side, creating a coanda effect, and so it pushes or pulls the fuselage sideways. At the end of the tail boom is a rotating cone where the remainder of the air is vented out to provide precise additional yaw axis control. That's the left-right movement of the nose of the helicopter. This system is obviously much safer without any rotor blades on the back of the helicopter. It saves on mechanical linkages and has less vibrations, so it's more comfortable. The system is up to 50% quieter and a big bonus is pretty much all the power available is directed to the main rotor and helicopter pilots are always happy to have more power. These different types of anti-torque systems keep the helicopter straight but as with the main rotor, the pilot has the ability to adjust the pitch angle of the blades to direct the tail rotor thrust to the left or the right as needed. This is controlled by pushing on the pedals. Now we know how to make a helicopter go up and down and how to turn on a spot. So let's look at how to move forwards, sideways and backwards. The main rotor blades spin so fast that they take on the form of a solid, rigid disc. We call this the rotor disc. When going straight up or down, the rotor disc is horizontal and has the same amount of lift all over. To fly in a certain direction, the pilot is going to tilt the rotor disc in the direction in which he would like to go, generating more lift on the opposite side. For example, to go forwards, he will add lift to the aft half of the rotor disc. The pitch angle of each individual blade is constantly changing as it turns around the hub, tilting the rotor disc in the direction of flight, being it forwards, sideways, or even backwards. 
Controlling the pitch angle of the blades, whether it be collectively to climb and descend or individually for direction, is most commonly achieved with a swash plate system, although other systems do exist. The swash plate has two main superimposed parts. The drive shaft or main rotor mast passes up through the two parts to drive the hub and the rotor blades. This lower non-rotating part is rigidly attached to the airframe and is connected to the pilot's controls with these control rods. This upper part is attached to the rotor mast by the scissors, ensuring that it rotates together with the rotor hub. These are pitch links. Each blade has one and they transfer the pilot's inputs to the blades, changing the pitch angle. To fly upwards, the pilot pulls up on the collective control and vertically raises the entire swash plate. Each blade pitches upwards equally. To descend, he pushes down on the collective, lowering the swash plate and reduces the pitch angle of the blades. To fly forwards, the pilot pushes the cyclic command forwards, which would tilt the swash plate. As each blade turns, the pitch link adjusts to the tilt of the swash plate, so the pitch angle of each individual blade is constantly changing as it turns around the hub. There will be more pitch and more lift at the back half of the disc, tilting it forwards, thrusting the helicopter in a forward motion. The same principle applies for turning left, right, or even flying backwards. Now, you would think to tilt the rotor disc forwards and fly forwards, you would tilt the swash plate forwards, right? Well, actually, no, you'd be wrong. It doesn't work like that. In a Robinson, with the rotor disc spinning anti-clockwise, you would tilt it right. And in a Cabri, with the rotor disc spinning clockwise, you would tilt it left. Now, that doesn't make sense, does it? It will once you understand something called gyroscopic precession. A gyroscope is a spinning object like a wheel, spinning top or rotor disc. There are two main properties of a gyroscope. The first is its rigidity in space or rotational inertia. A spinning object has the tendency to want to maintain the axis on which it's spinning. Here you can see a spinning wheel hanging from a rope and it's staying upright. It has momentum, or more specifically, angular momentum. To know the direction of this angular momentum, use the right hand rule. Curl your hand with the fingers pointing in the direction of the spin and your thumb will point to the direction of the angular momentum. You can also see that the spinning wheel is turning around its vertical axis towards the left. This is the second property of a gyroscope called precession. Our wheel is hanging on a string, so it has the force of gravity pulling the axis down and the opposite force of the string pulling the axis up on this side. You can imagine the two forces making the wheel turn in this direction, creating torque. Use the right hand rule again to find out the direction of the torque. Curl your hand with the fingers pointing in the direction of the turn and your thumb will point in the direction of the torque. The angular momentum will change to follow the direction of the torque, making the wheel turn to the left. Our R22 rotor is spinning anti-clockwise, meaning the direction of the angular momentum is upwards. If we tilt the swash plate forwards, we are applying torque in this direction. As the angular momentum will move in the direction of the torque, the rotor disc will actually tilt towards the left and the helicopter will fly left. In order to fly forwards, you have to tilt the swash plate right, applying torque in this direction. The angular momentum will move in the direction of the torque, the rotor disc will tilt forwards, and the helicopter will fly forwards. You can see the effect will always be approximately 90 degrees after the control input. Now flying a helicopter is hard enough and having to think about all of this would make it very confusing. Thank goodness helicopters are manufactured in such a way that the pilot just pushes the cyclic in the direction he would like to fly and the helicopter goes in that direction. So here you have some basics of how a helicopter works, but if you would like to know more about what a pilot does to fly a helicopter, subscribe and stay tuned for the next episode. See you soon!